Uh, let me explain what I'm saying here. Um, there's one thing to see historical events occur. And I believe that the New Testament events are historically accurate. I mean, I, I believe they happen. I'm not questioning. For, for me, I think the evidence is plain that Jesus did, in fact, live. He, and he did what he is recorded to have done in the scriptures. And he did die on the cross. And he did rise from the dead. And he did ascend back to be with the Father. I think those things all happen. On the other hand, the issue of why he did these things is a point that I think has to be argued. <clears throat> and these are differences between two concepts. History, in German, essentially refers to the facts of what occurs. But the next term is Heil's Geschichte. And this is a theological term that's used, a German term. Uh, well, I, don't, I guess you could say it's because of Luther in the sense that the Reformation as we know it started in Germany and a lot of scholars came from German roots, I guess. But how's Geschichte? Geschichte is also a word for history. A story, you're saying, yes. And Hiles means holy. But usually they say this is salvation history, or it, what it is is a theological interpretation. In other words, when you look at the cross, you could say, I see that Jesus is dying. History. But when you say, I see that Jesus is dying. For me, or I'm saying Jesus is dying for the sins of the human race, when I bring the theological meaning out of the historical event, that becomes Hausgeschichte over against history itself. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Is that a, ter is that a name of an individual or a term? No, that's a term. Okay. You have also you have a Geschichte group, a Geschichte family. You have Formsgeschichte, Hausgeschichte, Redaktionsgeschichte, Überlieferungsgeschichte. You have all those Geschichte guys, and they're a family in biblical criticism. <laughs> all right. I just want to learn how to say it. I'm sorry? I just want to learn how to say it. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> Geschichte. Heil's Geschichte. You can say, the, the best, talk about the Ibeli Ferus Geschichte Lucas Schuler. And that'll get everybody down. You catch that word? Ibeli Ferus Geschichte. Geschichtliche. It's an adjectival form. It means tradition history. Yeah, that which is handed over. So it's tradition history is Ibeli Ferenc Geschichtliche Schule. That's a history, that's a, the tradition history school of thought. So anyway. How's that related again? I have no idea. I just thought it's neat. <laughs> I just think it's neat to say. <laughs> it's just like the word I tell you, you know, about Matthew 16, the important things you can tell people that's a future perfect past the paraphrase to construction. Once you've done that, you've, all, you've ended all the debates. There's nothing else to argue. <laughs> future perfect past the paraphrase to construction. Passive Yeah, future perfect passive paraphrase to construction. So if you can say that, then you, you know, it doesn't matter what anybody else says. <laughs> it closes the argument down. <laughs> And I'm out of here. Let's go. <laughs> oh, you'll understand later what that means because that's a Greek construction based upon the use of a participle and a perfect tense verb in a in a in a a a, 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 a phrase that that occurs in Matthew 16. It says, um, uh, "Whatever." You loose on earth shall be that which has been loosed in heaven. That's what it's called. Will be that which has been Future. loose. Future, then perfect passive, paraphrastic, which means it's the whole statement together. See, construction. So it's, it's, not, it's not really that technical. Future, perfect, passive, paraphrastic. So. It's the other dose if you say it. It's not Gazuntai. Heil's Geschichte. Yeah, but you were talking about, I 
I'm trying to relate it to that walking by the cross and not knowing yeah. anything. Uh, you, if, and it's just a historical happening. Yeah. Uh, but it, but what is the meaning of it? See, is there meaning? Meaning that has a a theological significance that relates to to God and man and salvation. That's what we're dealing with. When you look at the cross, you may see just a man dying, or you may see a man who is dying to atone for the sins of the human race, who's dying for me. It makes a lot of difference. Uh, for example, when the, uh, when the leaders of the Jews looked at him and says he saved others, he saved others, he cannot save himself. That's exactly true. They didn't realize what they were saying because, in fact, if he had saved himself, he would not have saved others. That's right. See, they didn't know what they were saying but with the words because his death was more than just a death. It was a death for a reason, a purpose, a meaning. And that's the Haas Geschichte. Salvation history. or that's, that's the normal use of the term. Okay. See, there's one advantage to going to seminary. You can speak in much more profound terms. All right, let's keep going. Uh, faith. Now, remember, I, I always insist that when we talk about faith, we don't mean faith that's irrational faith. We talk about faith that is rational, reasonable. Faith is built upon evidentiary uh, uh, examples, and, 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 and it's, it's evidentiary in nature, I should say. Uh, <clears throat> to hold to inerrancy is not to deny that there are problems, nor, nor that satisfactory answers are, are yet to be found to many of these problems. It is acknowledged, see, that when such problems are encountered, one places trust in the scriptures. Now, if in fact I never saw the scriptures ever come through, and it was always it was always reading the scriptures against reason. That is. Every time I came across the scriptures, what, my, what I know and experience and in history and other contexts was always contrary to scripture. I had problems with scripture, quite honestly. It would be an irrational scripture. I have no problem with the fact that I can't solve everything. But I had better see some correspondence to truth occasionally. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's why I'm saying it must be terrible being a Mormon and trying to defend the Book of Mormon. Can you imagine having a whole world like Narnia or like Lord of the Rings, you know, that you can't find any historical correspondence to. I'm afraid burning in my bosom is not enough to get me through. My mind is too desirous for facts for that. I mean, I can look at the scriptures and I can find Israel. See, it's on the map. And the cities and the towns and the peoples and the experiences and the cultures. There's enough correspondence to fact that I don't have to have every problem solved. But if I, did, if I couldn't find the places and the peoples and the things anywhere, I have some serious questions about the book. You understand? So I don't believe in an irrational faith. But I don't have to have every problem solved to accept the scripture. I'll never solve every problem in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, if, if I actually, listen to this, if I actually could solve every problem, I don't have a lifetime sufficient probably to do it. To go look at all the evidence and examine it for myself. At least to everybody's satisfaction. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, there's, you know, the, the book's a big book. <laughs> So, uh, so I don't mind difficulties. Careful scholarship usually solves those things. Perhaps this is a place for a word regarding the matter of intellectual honesty. In this age of sophisticated superintellectualism, the accusation that the conservative holds inerrancy only because of intellectual dishonesty seems to be particularly devastating. This discussion should not be construed as a brief for strained interpretations or sloppy scholarship. <laughs> Certainly we do not want to be guilty of either, but this is the but is this the only alternative to an errant Bible? This is the impression that Mounts gives when he maintains that in conservative scholarship all factual discrepancies are laid at the doorstep of errant copyists. Several observations may be made regarding such a statement. 
in the first place. It is not true that all discrepancies, apparent or actual, are dealt with in this way. In some cases, the problems are interpretive rather than transcriptive. And in others, it is readily admitted that satisfactory solutions are not yet ready at hand. Furthermore, as Mounts himself acknowledges later in the same article, some discrepancies have undoubtedly arisen in the course of scribal transmission. No careful student of the scriptures should allow himself to be intimidated into thinking that appeal to the possibility of errors in transmission is a less than honest approach if he has pursued every other alternative scholarship affords short of resignation to errant autographs. It should be noted that such an approach as this is no more suspect than that which moves on the assumption that there were errors in the autographer. In other words, how would you prove that, by the way? Prove to me there are errors in the autographer. You can't. In the final analysis, neither viewpoint can be proved inductively since the autographer is not available, whereas a view that maintains the originals were inerrant is the only view that is consistent with the Bible's teaching regarding its own origin and character. So the point of it is, you can't prove or disprove there were errors in the autographer, but you can demonstrate that at least the Bible we have claims to be without error. So that's where you're left. I mean, you can either say that the Bible and those statements are wrong or right. You two positions. Uh, the point of it is, there are many other solutions. There are there are reasons why sometimes probably the manuscripts are. Uh, faulty at certain places, particularly with reference to numbers, because of the inherent problem with numbers, particularly in Hebrew, the way they wrote, it's subject to 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 uh, getting the wrong number down. But uh, having said that, uh, the the original manuscripts we have are very very good, very good, better than the rest of the world's books. Do you realize the, the, that if you take all the major works of the ancient world that people use as scholars, you know, in scholarship, Plato and Aristotle and Aristophanes and the works of Homer and, and uh, that which is purported to be from, Plato, uh, you know, from uh, Socrates and, and then those other works of antiquity in both Latin and Greek form, you, know, all, you go through all the works of the ancient world. Uh, rarely do you find any of those that you find an actual... The, from the date they were written, let's say if you had Plato written in 400, uh, it's about a thousand years later before you have a copy of Plato uh, around. It's about a thousand years from the actual writing in the manuscript to the, to the earliest copy of it. And even then you may not have more than five or ten copies. That's true with Aristotle, that's true with Aristophanes and and the various Latin authors and on the way through. You, I don't think I'm following what you're saying. Sorry. You mean the, the original handwritten? Yeah, let's say. Last of the thousand years, is there a copy? No, I'm saying Plato wrote, let's say, in, I don't know what his date was, 400? Okay. 400 BC. It was copied, you know, but we don't have any of these copies. The earliest copy we have is about a thousand AD, and that may be off a little bit. Maybe a, maybe eight hundred or seven hundred. Whatever. It's about a thousand years. So that's really more than that's fourteen hundred. But whatever it is, it's more than about a thousand years or so. I fail to see the significance other than there's a big gap there. Well, the gap is. You have all this time not accounted for in looking at copies to see how accurate this copy is with what would have been the autographer. So just as if it was written, what, well, you have no way to judge how accurate this copy is. You have nothing compared to it that's earlier. So just as if he had written it in thousand years. Well, no, it's not just as if he had written it because he if he had just written it here, then you'd have a copy of an autographer. I mean, you'd have an original writing. Because of where it and that would have been, and that would have been very reliable. If there was original <laughs> autographer, but no, original autography is all autographers are original. original. If there was a original writing, I, if there was original writing, that was uh, if it was here, copied somewhere near a thousand AD. That's all. Asking. Yeah, but then you'd have you'd have something very very reliable. 
for sure, because it would be near to the time it was written. The more the time that passes, you tend to get farther and farther and farther away from the writing. That tends to be the problem. Now, the difference between that and the Bible, what you're saying then, is we have more examples along the way to check. Yeah. The Bible has more than, more than 5,000 manuscripts. Plato has about I don't know, five or six. And there's a trail. Of <laughs> and the Bible has manuscripts that date within, uh, it depends on what the version is, but it has dating that goes back into, let's say, within a couple hundred years or so. But you even have certain portions like John's Gospel that dates back, you know, you got, to, you got a portion of it that dates within a generation of John's writing to demonstrate how close it was. But then in the church fathers, you essentially have the entire New Testament written in the fathers. You could actually reconstruct the entire New Testament with just a few verses lacking from, writing, from, from the quotes that are found in the church fathers. What about to see the same thing? How, how good his manuscripts are? They're pretty good. Yeah, they're pretty good. But, what was the dating on Josephus? Wasn't that like 300 or 400? Well, Josephus, he wrote his about, oh, AD uh, 75, 80, someplace oh, there. So really yeah, he wrote it right after the destruction of Jerusalem. So how do we know that Plato lived back then unless someone wrote about him? Well, my goodness, that's what you're dealing with. You have to believe people. Well, See, there's only, only two ways to have knowledge, by personal direct encounter and experience or by reading what somebody else says. Okay, so that's what we have, basically. We believe he lived back there because people said he did. Well, someone made a, like Josephus made, made a comment about Plato. Uh, and you have other writers who make comments about Plato. So I'm just saying that we know Plato lived because we trust what people said about Plato living. If everybody was making it up, then there's a person never lived that we think lived. Every bit of knowledge we have in the human race is by either direct encounter, experience, or by somebody else's testimony that we trust. I didn't go to the moon. See? But I'm trusting that somebody did because people said they did. They've shown me pictures and they've shown me books and so forth. But I wasn't there. Examples of the Mormon people trust that those people lived, but they didn't experience themselves. Right. And so they're trusting somebody else's writing. Now the issue of how reliable is the 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 testimony. And like I say, if I found no evidence of it, for example, if if you couldn't even demonstrate planes could fly, why should I believe a rocket ship got up there? The fact that I know that they send rockets up, I've seen pictures of them go up, I've seen planes go pretty high, I've been pretty high on a plane myself. So, you know, the fact that I know there's some of that technology there helps it make it more believable. And now, you know, you see this shuttle go up, or you see these other things go up, we've seen it on television, we're assuming that this is not done in a studio in Hollywood. Some people believe it was done in a studio in Hollywood, the whole thing, you know. Uh, there's that view. But I, 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 you know, I've seen enough that I, I think it's reasonable to believe that, in fact, people did go around the earth, people did go to the moon, and I saw pictures. I mean, I'm believing that, but I wasn't there. If these guys are playing a big trick, I mean, they got me. But that's the same with all these guys. We, we all believe what other people have written down for us, and then you have to try to figure out, is what they say reasonable or not? See. So... Um, so there's a separation in time. There's a, there's a few copies versus thousands of copies. And, and the New Testament also has 15,000 translation copies to compare with the Greek to determine the accuracy of translation. I mean, you, know, you, can, you can look among the translations and figure out about what probably was said, uh, especially as you look at different languages. So... Um, Faith, yes, but uh, and we don't have an autographer. We don't have original writings. But uh, we also don't have any proof that they weren't inerrant. <laughs> and since Scripture says that it's the Word of God, it, to me it's a problem to say it has error in it. 
<clears throat> now it looks down to the bottom. Uh, another way in which the conservatives' intellectual honesty is sometimes impugned is by suggesting that most attempts to harmonize passages that are apparently at variance with one another lead to unnatural results. Mao suggests that this problem arises from fostering a 20th century cons concept of error upon writers who lived in another time and culture. Because of this, quote, the exegete is obligated or obliged to force a harmony if necessary between all the apparent discrepancies of the scripture. Again, certain observations are in order. Cook goes on. The assumption that men of another day had different standards of truth from ours simply because they did not employ our so-called scientific method does not thereby mean they would be likely to call error truth. Uh, and I think that's true that's, that Cook has said that, but there is a factor. I do believe that you can judge people in another era by a standard that we have that doesn't necessarily fit into their context. For example, when you have certain levels of technology and measurement and then in fostering that measure of technology or measurement techniques upon a people that didn't have such a thing you can't call them in error because they don't measure by our standards I don't think that's an issue of truth versus error at that point uh, so I think in that sense Mounts is correct you understand me I mean you know it's a different assimilation of the same information. Yeah. I don't think it's error. In, our, in other words, I don't think what happened in their day would be error in our day if we understand that they are using approximation and not exactness like we do today. We tend to use more exact measurements. We, got, we can, we don't always, we can get down to millimeters and, and uh, even, even smaller forms. We, in, our, in our measurements of time, we can get down to split seconds and hundredth of a second. They didn't work in hundredth of a second. They didn't work in preciseness of measurements. They just didn't do it. They're working in, you know, <laughs> cubits. And, and and how big is a cubit? I mean, some people's arms are longer than others, you know. So what was it? Something like 18, 18 inches, something like that's a standard, but some were a little longer, some a little shorter. According to this short guy, tall guy, you know. So, uh, but approximately 18 inches. Like an imperial gallon, standard gallon, I guess. Yeah. And I don't understand that even. So, uh, so I do think in a, in a society that measured by cubits, to try to get them down to millimeters or preciseness of decimal points, is probably pushing it a little bit. Now we do that with science, but we don't do that with the theology of the early fathers. I mean, the we haven't progressed theologically past them, no, and can't hold them to a, a certain standard theologically even as we have not progressed philosophically. Some things, the, the ideas, uh, don't, don't necessarily take the same levels of measurement. <clears throat> Again, that's why I used the word technology a while ago. Technology doesn't mean people are smarter. It just means enough accidents have happened and we stumble onto enough things and things begin to fit together. That's basically what technology is, is, is the accumulation of accidents. So, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, philosophy, the, the, we can argue today philosophically in the same way that Plato argued philosophically. The mind hasn't changed. The world of thoughts haven't changed. And that's why theology and philosophy haven't changed in that regard. So where in science we cannot or should not hold them to the standards that we have today from a theological standpoint, I think we can hold on to theology. We our our have, morals. We almost have to go back to what they believed as mm -hmm. the basis for what we should believe. Yes, they haven't changed. That's why the Bible hasn't changed. Right. Okay. Because as the Bible presents to us truth and ideas and moral standards and so forth, those things are common for all of the human race, regardless of technological advance. So you could use the same thing today. I mean, you know. We, we are pretty technologically advanced in the United States, but go to some countries where they're just still riding donkeys. And there, there are places that they have, although, <laughs> although I have seen television antennas coming out of tents, but uh, there's a sense in <laughs> which I guess maybe technology has reached almost everybody. It probably still is not in New Guinea somewhere. <laughs> there's probably some place in Papua New Guinea they don't have them. But, uh, Generally speaking, there are different levels of technology in the world. Some are still very, very, very 
much like they would have been thousands of years ago. In other places, you know, it's just another existence. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, they do. Bedouins have cell phones. I stayed in a Bedouin camp uh, two or three summers ago, and they had uh, running water and nice restrooms and. They had cars. <laughs> they had cell phones. Uh, but they, oh, but they, oh, but they still had camels, and they still had donkeys, and they still had tents, and they still. Well, it's, they're they're modern Bedouins. <laughs> you know, they retained a lot of their old culture, but they've also moved right into the 20th and 21st centuries. So yeah, you're right; it's a little different. But uh, whatever. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's uh, read on here. The assumption that men of uh, another day had different standards of truth from ours simply because they did not employ our so-called scientific method does not thereby mean they would be likely to call truth or error truth. But more importantly, this raises the question of the integrity of the Holy Spirit. Are the standards of truth for the eternal God changed from age to age? If a parent discrepancies do not arise from scribal error, and without question there are instances when they do not, it may be that proper harmonization is not possible at this time because of information not now available to us. Quote, it may very well be that there are some passages which saved by, save by strained and forced attempts we cannot harmonize. If such is the case, by all means let us, sufficiently, let us be sufficiently honest and candid to admit that we cannot harmonize the particular passages in question. That is, you may not solve every difficulty to every single person's satisfaction. Did, did I give you that statement out of, a, out of Augustine somewhere? Yeah, here it is. Here's Augustine, 5th century, early 5th century, late 4th. When perplexed by something in Scripture which appears to oppose the truth, either the manuscript is faulty, there's the one possibility that we've talked about, or the translator has not caught the meaning of what was said. That's another possibility. Or I myself have failed to understand the meaning. <laughs> That's how Augustine dealt with it. And in all cases, the scripture stands. The scripture stands. If the scripture is errant, then we get a problem. Because if it's inspired, then God is an errant God. And then we can't know what is true and not true. And... We've got problems, real problems. I've got a quick question. I have not been able to get past the fact that we can say that there are some places where it may have been copied incorrectly, specifically numbers, hmm. and at the same time say, but we can trust everything else. I, I keep going back to that in my mind. Well, I, didn't, I would not say you can trust everything else. Okay, but you... You say that we can trust the scriptures. I would say, in as much as the copies reflect the autographa, it is they are in fact without error. But we don't we don't have a way to judge that. Oh yeah, we do. We have a statement that the autographa was. Correct. No, we have a science called textual criticism, okay. and it's a very exact science. You can figure out pretty well every reading in the in the Bible as what was and what was not probably the original reading. Just about every bit. They, they, the uh, textual critics say of the New Testament probably one thousandth of the text is, is only about one thousandth of the text has any degree of, uh, of error in it by copyist. And even those things are primarily spellings of words, word order. I mean have any degree of real error or any what are viewed possible as, error? No, no. What, what they view is probably have error. You have one thousandth of the Greek text in our existence which would be viewed as probably having error. And with that, you're still talking about errors like spelling errors and reversal errors and things that, and even those that are not those things are, are pretty well figured, you can pretty well figure them out. It's more mechanical than that. Yeah, there's mechanical issues. I mean, if, if I have, I'll, I'll show you, and the beauty of it is we have so many copies to compare them on. See, for example, I know that the manuscripts of the New Testament 
were copied. First of all, a letter from. I'm going to draw. I'm not a good artist, but you know, here's the boot. Here's Greece, Turkey, and the, that's the Mediterranean. Okay. Now in Rome. <laughs> We didn't say much. I love it. It's great. In Rome, you have uh, this right here is Mediterranean. That's water. Okay. Now you've got uh, you've got uh, that is really pretty bad. Antioch. Where's Antioch? I'll try again. Yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> and, and, and Gibraltar, don't freak it in. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Alright, let's see. Here. better? Yeah, beautiful. This is Achaia, sometimes called Greece. Italy, Rome, Ephesus, Antioch, Syria, Caesarea, Jerusalem, Alexandria. Later on, Carthage. Okay, those are major church centers. And the various documents of the New Testament begin to uh, accumulate in these major church centers. Now you realize they didn't have bookstores and presses and they printed thousands of these. It's a laborious process, an expensive process. You had to have money to get multiple copies. Papyrus was expensive, especially when you get to more, more significant materials like vellum or, uh, or something like a cow skin, goat skin, those kinds of things. Uh, what is it? Vellum is the uh, is the underneath of the cow, I think, over against the uh, the sheepskin. But they had ones that very you know they were heavy riding kinds of stuff. But the books, you know, Paul wrote a book to the Romans. It took a while for that book finally to be known. First of all, over here, even after it's known, to finally get somebody to go there and make a copy of it and get it back to them. This is decades for these things to happen. And, uh, but nonetheless, let's say a, we're going to, for our purposes, call the Roman document our, we'll call this uh, Syrian kind of document, we'll call it over here in Antioch, we'll call it A. Uh, matter of fact, I'll call it S because uh, Syria. Because I got an A down here with Alexandria. And uh, then you have a. Um, You, you have some copies that originate here also in the Jerusalem Caesarean area. We'll call that Jerusalem. Uh, Ephesians probably accumulated some. Anyway, the point of it is, uh, at these various centers, you had copies. Well, let's say, here's my case in point. Let's say I'm in Alexandria, and I go here to Rome, and I find the book of Romans. So I copy Romans, and I bring it back to Alexandria. Okay, well, let's say somebody from Ephesus goes to Rome and takes that same book of Romans, carries it back to Ephesus. All right. Now, let's say this Ephesian document. Let's say we have a statement: uh, God said to us, and the Greek would be "Hey, me." Whereas the another document down here at Alexandria said God said to you, and that's human. Not a lot of difference between those two words as far as uh, the way they look. Uh, plus, uh, the meaning could probably be make sense either way, you know. And by the way, that's why you have one, air, one textual variant in 1 John, because it means to you or, or to us, either one. Now, having said that, uh, how would you know which is the correct reading? Well, let's say this, this particular statement from Alexandria here, to you, 
uh, let's say that was written and copied 50 times, and every time the scribes wrote it, they wrote it to you. But every time a scribe up here copied the Ephesian document, they said to us. And let's say a th- uh, let's say 500 copies were made of that. Well, you don't you don't say well this has 10 times as many, so that means that's a correct reading. What you do is let's say you found a document up here, and it also let's say let's call this document X. So the X document we found it here and here and here, and uh, we found the X document over here. But when we compared this X document with this one over here, and we compared it, let's say, with, with another one over here, and everyone but this one in Ephesus says to you, then you say, hmm, well, there, there were different places, and they tend to agree with each other. Whereas this one tends to have all these others. And so everybody copied from him would say to us, everybody copied from this one would say to you, so you figure out, well, that to you is probably the correct one then, see. Because it has a, 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 a spread, see. You don't count how many documents, you count where was it being copied, see. And that's one way to determine. There are other things too, but uh, it's... How was that documented? Did they, were they able to document a location like that? They can do that, sure. Yeah, yeah. Style of writing, places that used it. Church fathers who quoted from it. There are a lot of ways to do these things. It's it's a it's a science, very technical science, but it's, it's but there are ways to figure this stuff out. Explain in John. I'm not sure where it is. First part of John it talks about the, one of the passages. We'll have a note in the NIV at least, and it says the earliest manuscripts don't have John. There are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one: the Johann and Comma, First John five seven and eight. Is that what you're talking uh, about? No, the, I don't have it with me, but there's a, uh, it's one of the stories, Woman at the Well. Oh, the book of John, so John, John 7, yes. 53 through 8, 11. Yeah, yeah. is it the woman at the well? Yeah, that's, that's called the, uh, the pericope adulteri. And, I mean, that's a technical term. It's the, the, the pericope, the, the, the portion on the story of the adulterous woman. Yeah. Um, yeah, but... All the manuscripts have that. It just moves around a little bit in the manuscripts. So it's not the same location. It's, okay, because the note says some of the earliest don't have it. Mm. Is that incorrect? I don't think so. I think all the manuscripts have that one. 753. Let me see what my note says here. The words and every one of those are bracketed by the as not original. They are present in over 900 manuscripts. Uh, okay, let me get my Greek text out. I thought I'd bring it here. It is. So. Okay, uh, I take my I take it back. You do have uh, P sixty six and seventy five of Sinaiticus and Alexandrinus and Vaticanus, a number of others that don't have that, but you do find it in the uh, what is known as the Bize manuscript, which is pretty old. Uh, all the Byzantine, also the Apostolic Constitutions, some of the works of Ambrose, uh, several Greek and Latin manuscripts, Jerome, Augustine, Ambrosier. Ambrosiostra, I should say. Uh, there, there are a variation of manuscripts which have the passage. Some have it, some don't. So um, I am, I'm mistaken. I was thinking it just moved, but uh, apparently it's, there's a division of the manuscripts. Uh, but notice that it says it is, added, is added in some late manuscripts of Syriac, Coptic, Armenian, uh, Georgian, Slavian, the Diatasserim. By the way, the Diatasserim dates back to the second century. That's from Tashian, the disciple of Just a Martyr. Um, Origen, which is about 180. Chrysostom, that's in the fourth century, early fifth. Cyril, Tertullian, Tertullian is late second century. 
Cyprian. So some of the doc, some of the uh, um, Oh, I see. Okay, I, I'm reading this wrong. Those ones I just mentioned did not have it, but it is found in some like Syriac, and these others uh, actually omit it. So there's a division among the manuscripts on it. So it's in, it's in Matthew, but it's just they're, they're arguing the story about the elders. Is it Matthew? I believe, well, I believe it is. It's, one, it's in one of the other. It wasn't just made up and put it in general. It's I think in it's one of the other books. Not that I know of. You mean John's the only place this story is? I believe so. Yeah, so uh, this, this is, there is a division of opinion on it. But you'll find it interesting that the Greek text that you use, that even has the textual stuff at the bottom, includes it in the text. Uh, it, they give it a... Uh, they give it an A reading which is good. So if it's missing from several of the earlier the, manuscripts, where, I mean, I where did it come from? from? Yeah, where did it come from? It's hard to say. It could be a story that's an oral, an oral story, an oral tradition that was picked up and copied and found its way into the manuscript a hundred years later. You have to understand, when you, with, you've only got a few passages that are really serious issues. John 7:53-11, the uh, pericope, uh, the uh, the Johannan comma. That's the First John 5, 7, 3 bear wreck in heaven. That one, um, and that story about the uh, the uh, uh, stirring of the waters in John. Those are, I guess, the three uh, in Mark 16. Other than those, other, all the issues are basically almost nothing. Very, very minor issues by and large. But you're talking about that out of an entire New Testament. Yeah, it's just, it just happens to be the book I was teaching this year. <laughs> no answer for it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's just... Um, uh, there's a division of the manuscripts. Which is, is it genuine or not genuine? So the, the issue is, I don't know. Okay. But I don't have to know everything. God didn't require me to know everything. So when you get to that story, though, what, you, it, you it, personally... It, seem, it seems to be genuine. It has a ring of genuineness, I think. But it, th there's the issue of how did it find its way into the manuscript tradition? Because it's found its way in some... Manuscripts and not in others. So I would simply say, uh, you know, it may be genuine, it may not be genuine, and it, it reads like a, a genuine story. I guarantee you, if you pick up and read some of the Gnostic stuff that people claim is gospel, you'll see it doesn't read the same way. But this reads like a genuine story with Christ. Um... So, let's see, the passage actually, 53 through 8.11, so if 8, then look what 8.12 says, then Jesus spoke to them again and say, I am the light of the world, he follows me, shall not walk in darkness. Let's see, you would then be having, uh, they answered and said to him, are you also from Galilee, search and look for no prophet has risen out of Galilee, if the story is not there, then the next statement is, and Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. So, uh, that story is, um, is, um, is debatable. I mean, I guess that's one of those things you say, hey, um, maybe, maybe not. But that's so little in comparison yeah. to the whole New Testament. And I agree. I agree. It's just a question I've had for. Yeah. Well, we we don't want to say what we can't we can't demonstrate. That doesn't do anybody any good. But it's just like, for example, I have very serious questions. I mean, I tend to feel this is probably genuine. There's a division of the manuscripts, and I think there's some good manuscript arguments that this is probably genuine. I think it reads like you'll hand in literature. I think it sounds like a genuine story of Christ. Uh, I have real problems with Mark 16:9 through 20. 
I think there's far more reason to doubt Mark 16 than there is this passage. For the same reasons that you just stated. Well, yeah, because it, 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 it leaves, it, it sounds more like second century apocalyptic, or not apocalyptic, but apocryphal um, literature than it does like a first century reading. And if it's true, then we have some theological problems. Because in Mark 16, it says that he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. So the belief there is specifically belief unto salvation. And then it says, and these signs shall follow those that believe that we just talked about, those who believe in the salvation. Those who believe sal it, these signs shall follow those people. One, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall, if they, uh, they shall heal the sick. You know, they shall... Uh, they, they'll cast out demons, you know, they will, they, they'll pick up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, they'll not harm them. And you read these passages, it doesn't say these are things they might do or they can do. It says they will do them. People who believe will do these acts. I have never picked up a serpent. I have never drank deadly things to my knowledge. I mean, some have tasted that way, but uh, I haven't, I, I haven't, really in my opinion spoken with new tongues even though I grew up a Pentecostal and did a lot of it and so when I read those passages say those are the requirements of those who believe so if a person says he believes he ought to be doing those things can I read the note that this says on what on that passage on Mark 16 9 through 20 yeah yeah okay Maybe. sure no. what well, says uh, the, word, the verb believe in Greek is in the aorist tense is that something we'll have next week Eight just, 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 just a second, just a second, just a second. We're talking about a different passage. No, 16, no, we're talking about. I just want to get my Greek 17, out and look at it. Sixteen seventeen. Hold on, hold on. Okay, now I'm okay. Pistusas. 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 Mm-hmm. What about it now? Which refers to those who did believe, not those who would believe at that time or in the future. That's what he says. Well, it says the, 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 when you when you have when you have verse sixteen, you have ha pistusas and kai baptistes sostesite. Uh It says the one having believed and been baptized will be saved, and the one having disbelieved will uh, will be condemned. And these shall, signs shall follow the ones who have believed, these signs shall follow the ones who have believed. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. These are all future there. And then uh, they will end, lay hands on the sick and they shall uh, get better. If they shall uh, uh, see Kairos, what is that? What is verse 18? Give me the verse 18 there. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Yeah, is that and it? They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Right. Let's see, let's see. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. All right, I didn't know the word there. Okay, uh, the... Uh, the fact is that they, they um, are talking about things there that sound like what you encounter in the second century literature. In the second century literature, you see a lot of this kind of, you know, demons and stuff, writing stuff like this. But I, uh, these are things that actually follow those who have believed. So if if you are actually a believer, you should be doing them. It's not. It's not saying that you do them if you're believing about doing them. The word believe here is referring to someone who, is, who has embraced Christ. Everyone who's embraced, embraced Christ should be doing these things. But, but, but it's, these aren't, it's not saying these are inclusive. These aren't the only things that would come to Well, no, there may be other things, but at least these will. will. Well, that's, that's all right. right. So have you done all these things? I haven't done any of them, but... Guy next door might. No, no, no. It's not, it's, not, it's, it's not. Some believers might. It's these things. Of the ones who have believed will do this. Since they will. Yeah, if you haven't done them, you haven't believed yet. It's, it's, not, it's not a partitive concept where some, 
among all the Christians in the world be a few who do this and a few who do this. No, it's not. So those who, it's, for the, it's just like the baptism. You don't get some Christians being baptized, others not being baptized. The one who have believed and is baptized will be saved. And these signs shall follow those that have believed that we just talked about. They'll do these things. But the apostles did things. The seventy went out and did things. Well, that's that great. Well, it, then, then you're, not, you're not saved, apparently. Because if you're saved, you'll do these things. That's the point I'm making. The passage is teaching that individuals who have believed and are saved will do these acts. These are signs of having of being a saved person. Your difficulty with this passage is it sounds like what you, what that's, a, my, that's my theological problem with okay, it. Okay, but is there a there are textual manus- problems too. It's not found it's not found in the manuscripts. You don't find it in any manuscript until about the eighth century. I don't see the problem with it myself. I mean, I don't. So, well, I may have gifts and do things in practice well, that you don't know about. It. Well, no, no, no. It's okay. I, I mean, if see you, what I'm I mean, yeah. Well, it, Okay. Jack, Jack, if you listen, Jack, if you have picked up snakes, if you have raised the dead for or, or cast out demons, if you have uh, drunk deadly things, if you have healed the sick, if you spoke with new tongues, if you've done all of these things, then you shouldn't have any problem with the passage. No, it, I don't see it that way. Not, Why? I'm not only I'm saying that's what it's getting at. It's not a partitive concept. It's not saying among all believers, certain things will be done by believers in general. Wasn't it kind of like the gifts of the Spirit? No, not here. When it lists the gifts of the Spirit, no. it's not every gift that ever... No, but see, but see Paul, Paul deliberately uses distributive uses of terms. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, read it, Paul specifically, to sum this, to sum this, to sum this, to sum this, to sum this. Paul lays it out partitively, where he... He says that gifts are spread among different people. This passage is not saying this. This passage says those who have believed will do this thing. So if you haven't believed, then I don't see any basis upon you know, if you haven't done these things, I don't see any basis you've believed. So it's not a it's not a separated idea. So why is it included in our Manuscripts today. If it, back well, because it's based upon, uh, boy, you know, we sure got a far afield, but it's, I guess it's okay. Uh, it's based upon a manuscript tradition. Uh, there was a manuscript tradition that developed called the Syrian manuscripts. There's several terms majority text type, Syrian manuscripts, Byzantine. Those are the three basic terms used. That developed around, starting around the 8th, 9th centuries, all the way up until the time of Erasmus in the 16th century. Erasmus was the uh, opponent of Luther, but he was also the most brilliant classical scholar of his day. And Erasmus gathered together a few manuscripts out of the thousands that were available and put together a text, a Greek text, just like this thing. I mean, not just like it, but this kind of book, you know, with Greek words in it and covers, and, you know. And people used that to translate from. But Erasmus used just a handful of manuscripts and not always the best manuscripts. Erasmus didn't even have any access to manuscripts that dated earlier. But now it's just the same problem. You know, you had manuscripts that developed at one place, but when you compare them with manuscripts in other places, you find out that there's too many differences in readings between them. So there are many readings that are the same. And if you were to say... Even the Byzantine manuscripts tend to agree with all the others. But they have peculiar readings that are unique to themselves that others don't have. And so those are called the majority text type. And that's from that, it's from that which you actually got the, uh, the King James. Now the problem with the King James at this point, it, it, first of all, it, it, remember all the manuscripts, let's say this, even with these little problems, most of even those manuscripts are, are very good and they agree with everything else. It's the peculiarities we're talking about. And uh, Erasmus produced a Greek text that ended up being used in a revised form by the King James translators. The new King James that I use, at least the scholars went back when they did this and went back and checked the majority text type in general and not just Erasmus's Greek text. See? And also we're aware of the different readings in other places 
called the Alexandrian manuscripts and the Western manuscripts as well as the Syrian or Eastern manuscripts. So they were aware of the different text types. Erasmus didn't deal with any of that and that's where the King James came from. But even with that, most of it's right. But you got a real problem with Erasmus. Do you realize Erasmus, the last, what about, again, don't hold me to this because you're hitting me with things tonight. I haven't gone back to check these things for years. You know, some of this stuff I haven't looked at for years, 20 years. So I'm trying to think out of the top of my head. But I think it was about, 11, about the last 11 verses of the book of Revelation. Erasmus didn't have any Greek manuscript with those verses in them. So he went back to the Latin Vulgate and translated from Latin into Greek. No manuscript in the history, in the history of the world or anything ever in existence reads like Erasmus's last several verses of Revelation. Because they're not copying a Greek manuscript, they're translated from Latin into Greek, and there's nothing that looks like them. And his are identified as majority texts? Well, he borrowed a few manuscripts from that majority text tradition, yes. But even the Texas Receptus that he created doesn't read like the majority of manuscripts in general. I mean, they, they, have, they have unique little, little things in them. It's a very technical science. And, uh, but we can pretty well ascertain what most of all the New Testament is. Any other questions? So because Mark 16 has some, a shroud of question around it, it it's, as, a, it's, as a pastor, I would never preach from it. I would never say authoritatively, I can preach from this text. And I have a hard time with Mark 16, 9 through 20. It's, it's, it's a problematic passage. I, I, I really believe it probably was never part of the original manuscripts. And Stanley was the last person in the 16th? 9 through 20. The manuscript tradition is so poor. Uh, again, you don't find it in any manuscript until almost a thousand years after the time of the New Testament. <laughs> now, there have been people to argue very, very ferociously for it, and very sincere people. I mean, they're no dummies. I mean, Dean Bergen, B U R G O N, wrote a book, I've got it in my library, about that thick, arguing for Mark 16, 9 through 20. He, makes, he, uh, he has as eloquent an argument as anyone can make for it. He's become, I mean, has he sort of been the spokesman for? Or that, I mean, yes, and tend to, the King James only translation people that's tend to go to Dean Bergen. And he was a fine scholar. I'm not criticizing him. He's a good scholar. And he brings forth all the arguments that one would want to make. That is, he would argue uh, that uh, there are places seemingly left in even the what we call the Alexandrian manuscripts, like Sinaiticus, Vaticanus. There's seemingly enough room at the end of Mark, at the end of the manuscript, that they say, well, something should have been put there. I mean, the author left room to put it there because he sensed that there must be something else that fits there and he didn't have it. That's an argument from silence. I mean, why, how do I know why the guy left room? He finished it and he, he got... He, the, 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 if you look at the manuscript, <laughs> it, the, it comes, you know, it's here... You know, you get this big manuscript. I don't know how. He writes, and then all of a sudden you got all this room. Well, the reason why he may have stopped there is he ran out of something to say, and he just started on the next page. I don't know why he left the big space. <laughs> His argument is, and those others, well, he knew that Mark 16, 9 through 20 must have fit there, and he just didn't have any proof for it or something. I don't know. That's just an argument from silence. How do, how do you argue that way? I don't know what was in the guy's mind. His name's Dean Bergen. B-U-R-G-O-N, yeah. B-U-R. Mm -hmm. Very fine scholar. But uh, I don't agree with him. Is he, is he alive today, Bergen? Only if he's about 200 and... Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, he's... he's <laughs> you were treating his present tense, I didn't think... But his, his writing is still with us. No, he, he was back in the, uh, the middle of the 19th century, I guess. But... Uh, you know, he makes his arguments. He tries to argue the majority text type in reference to this and the later writings. And, you know, it's okay. I mean, 
nobody, you're not a heretic to hold another view on this thing. I just don't think that uh, it's, it's a valid argument. Yeah, I would not base it. It's okay to say we don't know. I mean, it's okay to say. Well, I, yeah, I, I can say I can say I don't know, but I I will say I don't know for sure. But my my the probability in my view is that it is not. In other words, to me, the the greatest evidence is to reject it as part of the text. And I notice I uh, make a statement in 9 through 20 in my study notes here. The authenticity of these last 12 verses has been disputed. Those who doubt Mark's authorship of this passage point to two 4th century manuscripts that omit these verses. Others believe they should be included because even these two manuscripts leave space for all or some of these verses. That's the argument. Indicating that their copyists knew of their existence. That's the argument. I don't agree with that argument. I'm saying if I were a copyist and I knew that something went here, I'd figure out, I'd go find it and put it in here. <laughs> Why don't I just say, well, I'll just leave it for posterity. Put it out there. The or something, yeah, you know. The difficulty is knowing whether the space is for this longer version of Mark's ending or were for one of the alternate readings found in the manuscript. There are other readings of Mark, the end of Mark's gospel. Not the big long one, but there are alternative readings besides this one in the manuscripts. Which one is it? Or any of them? Uh, practically all other manuscripts contain 9 through 20, and this passage is endorsed by such early church fathers as Justin Martyr, Tashian, Irenaeus. It does not seem likely Mark and the historian a note of fear. By the way, that was added by the someone else besides me. I, I was just going to say, that seems to be... That was no, added by saying. somebody besides me. Okay. Remember, when we gave this to the publishers, they still had one in-house editorial group that finished the project. And there are times that they added what they viewed as a balancing viewpoint to some of my more Calvinistic and uh, non-feministic perspectives sometimes. And I had to go back and try to change them occasionally. But I didn't get everything. Um, but uh, quite honestly, he. It depends on what you mean here by him ending on fear. They were afraid. Um, some would say, well, that's a bad ending. That's also the same basic kind of ending that one finds uh, in a couple other Gospels. Uh, not the final ending, but you do have that as a statement. Now, if there was another conclusion, uh, who's to say it's this one? Because in one of the other Gospels, one of the endings has some kind of triumphal thing, you know, so they, so they went from there and spread the Gospel all over the world, or something like that, you know. It's, it's a very upbeat kind of thing, so why not that ending? <laughs> yeah, so this one's included, that one's included right here. All right. What, what's your say? Mine says, and they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions, and after that, Jesus himself sent out through them sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Well, that's a good ending. Why not that one? That way you don't have... Uh... Uh, this is Joseph Smith's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hebrew Bible. All right. I'll tell you what. Let me finish one little part here. Next week we come together again. We'll start at page 83. We'll do 83, 84, 85... And then we will uh, finish the authoritative. We'll get all the way through page 88. And then we'll finish some stuff I have here. Let me just finish this providence of God. The final line of evidence, this is Cook's, in support of the inerrancy of Scripture is a providence of God. An understanding of this truth will further enable us to see that the human instruments do not render the written revelation of God fallible and erroneous. Warfield, again, I encourage you to read Warfield, says, quote, if God wished to give his people a series of letters like Paul's, he had prepared a Paul to write them. And the Paul he brought to the test was a Paul who spontaneously would write such letters. Well, that's a great quote. <laughs> this is a more, a most biblical statement as is borne out by such a passage as Galatians 1, 15 through 16. If we bear this in mind, we shall know what estimate to place upon the common representation to the effect that we cannot get from a man a pure word from God. As light passes through the colored glass of a cathedral window, we are told is light from heaven, but is stained by the tints of the glass, so any word from God which passes through the mind and soul of a man must come out discolored by the personality through which it is given. 
But what if this personality itself has been formed by God into the precisely the personality it is for the express purpose of communicating to the world word given through it just the coloring which it gives? When we give due place in our thoughts to the universality of the providential government of God, to the minuteness and completeness of its way, to its invariable efficiency, oh, excuse me, uh, efficacy. efficacy, we may be inclined to ask what is needed beyond this mere providential government to secure the production of sacred books, which should be in every detail absolutely according with the divine will. The problem is, or not problem, but the point is, that uh, when God is involved, he is able to secure what he wants done. I mean, you either believe God has power or he doesn't. Nothing is needed beyond mere providence to secure such books. So, anyway, we'll start with the complete next time. Well, when, the people, when they form the camp, this is a question I asked you before, and you said, we'll, we'll talk about that later. I don't know when we're going to talk about that. Well, if you look in, have you looked ahead in your notes here? Uh, yeah, actually. There's a section here on canon. So it'll, it'll answer. So we will talk about canon. And I'll bring one to show you. Canon. 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 Canon.